Okay, one try, will you please start the report? Okay, okay. So today I will present the paper, the lottery ticket hypothesis, finding sparse mm. trainable neural networks. So uh, it, it is uh, in the ICLR 2019, and actually it's the best paper of it. And uh, it's by John, Jonathan Franco and Michael Carvin. So both of us also are from MIT, mm. and uh, one is a PhD student, and the area of studying is studying the low level, low level behavior of neural networks with the aim of improving the performance of training models. And uh, his focus are on the lottery ticket hypothesis. Yeah, so that's, uh, it should be proposed by him. And uh, the, under, the second author is Michael Carbin. It's an ass assistant professor in MIT also. And his area is program language, software engineering, and deep oh, learning. Oh, really? We have a software people in MIT, but they are not. But... Uh, I'm just curious to keep going on. Yeah. So at, at, at the start, so I want to say one consensus of neural networks is that the over parameterization. So it means that actually our deep neural networks have too much parameters for do the uh, for doing uh, to performing a specific job. So which will also cause overfitting and uh, many problems. So we have to reduce model size to reduce computation time and power needed and to be able to work on sm smaller devices. Uh, yeah. So uh, for an arbit arbitrary task, neural network pruning can be used to first train a model using a very large model and then prune it to find a suitable model structure. So that's what is usually used in, in the industry uh, for a given task to do model training. Yeah, so in, in, instead of randomly choose a, a model structure and then do the training and then find the good one, they usually first train a model that is, has, is very large and then do then prune it to find a su suitable structure. Yeah, that's what you common usage of model pruning, uh, sorry, network pruning. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, terminolo the terminology, I will also introduce the terminology pruning here. So there are actually two kinds of pruning. One is called unstructured pruning. Second is structured pruning. For unstructured pruning, it's actually targeting on weights. So what means weights here? You, can, you may see the red lines. So these weights are connecting neurons to neurons from, from uh, um, upper to down, yeah. So uh, when, when, when unstructured pruning, it will cut the, um, these weights and manually set it to zero. So that means that it is pruned. But for structured one, it is quite different. Actually, it's neural level. So when say when we say prune structure pruning, actually we will delete some neurons in certain layers, and all the uh, weights connecting it will be gone. So that's the two difference. And uh, for out for today's presentation, we will actually focus more on the first one. So it's also, so the model after the pruning is also called sparse structures. So which means that there's a lot of zeros in the weight matrix. So you may see the red, for example, the red lines are all zeros now, so they are pruned. So, but uh, one problem for this unstructured pruning is that, un uh, it, so if the hardware is not moderated to fit such pruning, actually, Doing this pruning actually won't speed up the computation much because uh, t timing the zero is also a uh, computation. Yeah, so that's one uh, something not good about this unstructured pruning. But uh, but anyways, uh, today's paper is focusing on this unstructured pruning. Yeah. So the motivation of the paper is that network pruning can reduce most model size significantly without sacrificing accuracy too much. However, contemporary experience is that the sparse ar architecture produced by unstructured pruning are difficult to train from start. If we can train it, uh, I mean, it here stands for the sparse architecture from start, would similarly improve training pro pro performance. So uh, instead of we first train uh, training a model and then prune it, so if we can do the uh, prune, prune it in the training process, like 
I we train several rounds, we print once, and we train another several rounds, and then we print again. So if we do so, we can save save some time to the uh, whole training process. Yeah, that, that's what they mean here. So they also um, proposed a hypothesis. So uh, the hypothesis is like this. I randomly initialized dense neural network contains a subnetwork that is initialized such that it can match the test accuracy of the original network after training for at most the same number of iterations. So this what may be a little bit hard to understand at the beginning. So what he means that, so for any model that is randomly initialized, we can prune it. So in, there is a way of pruning such that it can generate a subnetwork that can remain its performance, like to, to still performance as at least as good as the original model. So in a formal language, so it's, it's very long. So I just, uh, do, you, Levin, do you think I need to explain it or I, you think the previous one is clear enough? Um, I think you can, it's, a, it's good to show how you interpret the complicated formal language into your uh, abstracted version or natural yeah, language. Yeah, ac ac so, actually it's mm. quite simple. So mm. for, for example, we have um, a random initialized A and and we, let, let's say this is model A, and all the weights here are randomly initialized. Then there are several ways to prune it, right? Then we can randomly prune it, prune it and we may generate many Bs, for example, five or 10 Bs. And the hypothesis means that uh, there exists B for all A that B is better than A after a certain round of training. So I think this hypothesis yeah, it should be easy to understand. I understand your point. I understand your explanation. So what I mean is that let's go through the formal language a bit. Okay. There's a few students um, okay. here on uh, Ruofan, Xiaoling, so the PhD students. It's good then for them to not only understand the, the underlying rationale, but also uh, learn how to formalize the underlying idea into a formal, uh, into a more, essay or paper-like language. So that is very good. So I, I suggest that in this case, we go through the sentence line by line and to digest and uh, get comfortable with those sentences. Okay, so you may see what is um, in the or orange bracket. So mm -hmm. it's it's first the, the definition. So it's definition some uh, parameters there. So let's consider a dense feedback neural network F X and uh, uh, is this theta? Yeah, theta. With initial parameter theta equals to theta zero. So which means this F here just stands for the model. Theta means the weights. Yeah, X means the input. So this, how to explain these three words. And when optimizing with SGD on a training set, S reach the minimum validation loss L at the iteration J with test accuracy alpha. So it means that after several rounds of training, it, uh, the, the ability of this model can reach a validation loss of L and uh, accuracy of A. So that's, uh, that's, that's the start. So the hypo hypothesis means that let's consider a mask here. The mask is zero or one. So, um, so this means that it's a zero word masking. So if, and you may see it's mask times uh, theta. So it means that at this mask will turn some parameters in theta into zero if the mask is enabled. Otherwise the weight is retained. So that's what we say unstructured pruning before. So some weights in the structure, uh, in the model are pruned. So it's set it to zero ma manually. So this means pruning. And its initialization is M, M, yeah. So which means that, for example, we have uh, uh, here, the model on the left is randomly initialized. It's the first mo model A, and it is considering model B, which means that some, several lines here are set to zero, yeah. So we're also optimizing 
the SGD on the same data set, if so the new model can reach this uh, validation loss L at J with accuracy alpha, test, test accuracy alpha. So, uh, so this uh, hypothesis, so the hypothesis will say that we exist M. Um, so we see as a masking such that uh, within the number of iteration needed, we it can give a higher accuracy. Yeah. Mm. So this uh, the accuracy is higher. Meanwhile, this mask is smaller than theta. So this means the number of masks, and this means the number of parameters. So which means that it's, uh, the parameters are fewer. Yeah. So the number of masks is uh, so there are the assumptions that the number so the prune the number of prune uh, weights should be much less than the the whole the whole the whole set of the, the number of the whole set of parameters. Yeah. Right. Okay. That is the perfect explanation. But I think everyone supposed to understand this. Yeah, I think so. Mm. The hypothesis should be itself should be easy to understand. Mm. So oh, next oh, is by the, by the way, so is there any proof? Is there any proof <clears throat> that there always exists? Yeah, so <laughs> they mm. manually do this by experiment uh exper experiment. So there's no mm. Mass oh. proof that mm. such exists. So they just do it mm. by um, experiments. If so, there's the experiment, that means uh, it needs to conduct a large bunch of experiments because they have a lot of potential B and, uh, and there's yes, a correct. lot of the, a variety of the Bs. You can change the B size in different, uh, with different ratio. Yeah, correct. So, so, they are, uh, so that's the experiment part. So the model they choose are LeNet, which are MLP, and the ResNet, ResNet, ResNet 18, and the VGG 19. So the data sets they use is MIST and the cyber 10 only, so which are very small. So that's why this paper is being criticized. And the method of pruning is per weight magnitude based pruning. So we have also we have already mentioned that it's an unstructured pruning, so it means that it's targeting on weights. And the method of pruning they use a standard one, which is magnitude based. So it will just prune the weight if they are, if it is smaller than some value. Yeah, for a threshold. If yeah, that's the way they prune it. It's also a standard pruning method in unstructured pruning. And there are two strategies, pruning strategies mentioned. One is called iterative and one is called one shot. And I will explain it later. And there are also two training strategies strategies they used. One is called with resetting and one is continued training. And the best combination they, they found out during the experiment is that is to use iterative training with resetting. So both I will explain them one by one in the next few slides. So uh, what is one shot and what is uh, iterative. So actually they are very simple to understand for one shot. One shot means that we just do the pruning once. So we randomly initialize first, training several iterations, and then just prune it. Yeah, so that's the so one shot pruning is very simple, right? So, but one key point here is that there is a, there is called, there is called resetting in the, in the, so in the process. So what they says is that the resetting part here is very important. So to keep it, Walk, yeah. So that's the one they use. Um. <clears throat> so here it's going to resetting the parameters. Mm. Theta J. Oh, uh, sorry. So here the question: When we train the models, and uh, after we get a model on theta J and we remove the p percent of the parameters. Um, after that, you mean we restore the remaining parameters. The restore means that we recover. Uh, yeah. point, my point is that if they recover the original theta zero and the model performance is supposed to be the grade, right? Uh, so, um, let's recall hmm. the hypothesis. 
Mm. So actually, uh, let me erase the. <clears throat> so the hypothesis actually all targeting on theta, theta zero. So you may see the theta here mm. and the theta here. Mm. So actually, they are so all the step here are just to find the, uh, tickets. But we cannot guarantee that the ticket is a winning ticket. So the lottery is like we have a lot a lot of tickets. Mm. The hypothesis that there is one winning ticket that is very is that is good than the, all the others. It's so better, I'm sorry, it's, it's good than the uh, original it's, one. So it's better than the original one. Yeah, so it doesn't mm. it doesn't matter there are a few other tickets that is bad uh worse than the original model. As long as like this one is just creating one winning ticket. Actually they all mm. they are out. Oh so what do you mean that you that means in a sense that the authors actually randomly uh remove the people sent of the parameters. As okay. long as one of the options outperform the original ones, so their hypothesis somehow get a part of the evidence. Yeah correct. Mm. And the second way is called the iterative way. So the iterative way are also easy to understand. So instead of this third step once, actually it will speed into several parts. So it will prune percent s of the parameters once, and then again and again. Uh, recall that there's actually also a resetting part here. That is what is different in the next step. So I have also mentioned there's a continue train uh, part and the resetting part of the iteration, uh, iterative strategy. That will also make a difference. So here, I will introduce the best one here. So this is actually the, the best the combina combination of working strategy. And then, so at first we'll random initialize the model. Yeah. Then it will train the iterations, J iterations, it's the same, right? And then it will- now What do you mean by, <clears throat> um, uh, what is the differentiation means? Uh, may I ask you? The M equals huh? one, power theta. Okay. Okay. This means just that there's no masking. So mm -hmm. this M equals one theta means that all yeah. the thetas, all the mask is zero. So when multiply is original theta to equals theta. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So it means that there's no mask here. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Please go on. Yeah. And then it's, so during the training process after J iterations, it will create a mask M. So with so this M mask will like have uh, S percent more parameters that need to be removed. And then it will reset the weights to, to their value zero. So actually uh, the iterative, iterative uh, process is just repeating of the one shot process for many times and to reach and, and to finally reach the- Yeah, the, so, so here comes the question. So when they restore or using their word reset, the weights means that there's uh, unmasked, unmasked parameters or unmasked weights to the values in <clears throat> in theta zero because you are in the in your second in your second approach. Is there a repetitive? Do we need to make sure? Um, do we need to make sure we always we can find? Do we make sure that the, the algorithm continues? until we find the best the theta zero or the best set of the theta zero. Um, uh, may I make myself in the tool? So, so here, you, 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 we, you, they re reset the weights of the, they reset the weights from the theta zero, right? And uh, the model performance largely depends on S, the percent of S, right? So we do not care about this percent of s. We care about it, pm minus s, and we restore theta zero. So it seems to me that the chance is very slim if we get an arbitrary set of theta zero. It must we must try a few times, and then <clears throat> then we have a chance that we can got an a subset of the initialized parameters or the subset of the theta zero, so that the new M or the, the new the new model can outperform the original one. Yeah, correct. So the experience five, uh, if, if I remember correct, correctly, so they create five and there's at least one is better than the original one. So that means after they train the model for a while, they just need to sample 
uh, from the theta zero five times, and then the chance they, they got a chance to improve the original model. Uh, if I recall correct, correctly, so this actually is one, so this is the whole iteration to create one ticket. So okay. after this step, it will create one ticket and it will repeat five times. It will have five tickets and it will do the training on these five winning tickets. Uh, do remember that the, way the, the parameters here are randomly initialized. So, uh, so it, is, it, it do not have some bias to the uh, correct examples. And when training these five random initialized tickets, they found that there's at least one or two is better than the original model. The mm. or original initial, initialized model, yeah. Mm. Am I clear? <clears throat> uh, uh, my uh, last question. So when they um, pick up the five tickets, so is there any criteria for those five tickets? The, the tickets, does, as I mentioned, does each ticket required to be outperform the original one? Uh, actually, there's no, uh, we do not say there's a, uh, there is a, cri a cri criteria because they are using a standard pruning method. So mm. uh, they will automatically pick the, this, this percent of weights that is smallest and then do the pruning. Uh, pruning. Yeah, so I mean, when it, they will pick up the p value, and randomly sample the p parameter, the percentage of the p uh, in the parameters to create the tickets, right? And uh, since the process is fairly simple, it means that we can create a thousands of tickets. No, I, I, I don't think so. With a certain uh, seed, the, the parameter to be pruned is fixed. Uh, no, when we train, the training process happens on step two, right? So yes. The, the, that's the most costly step. And yep. the proning, from my point of view, takes almost no cost. So that means if we can, well, if we if we sample a p, if giving a p, when we sample from this theta j, we can get a lot of uh, new model or a lot of new uh, no. model. So that's, we, so that's what I mean. The pruning method is fixed. So they mm. cannot just sample some of them and prune it. They mm. just select those magnitude that is smaller. So for example, they find this P of smallest magnitude, absolute value magnitude weights, and then just print. So, uh, sorry, so can you repeat that? So suppose so we with get a given mm -hmm. model, if the weight is fixed, the mm -hmm. pruning method is also fixed because the pruning method they choose is magnitude based. So it mm -hmm. will just prune the smallest P percent weights Oh, so, so you mean that you rank the weights and we remove yeah, the correct. smallest one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so it will so by by your point, uh we can only prone one model. Yeah, with one seed. With one seed. So they keep initializing the network. Yeah, they, they have five random seeds to initialize. Okay. Okay. Let me think about it. We train a model in theta j, and we prone the parameter j, and restore it, create a ticket. Mm. And for the second approach, they after they prone, they keep training. After they prone, they they restore the values and they they train again. Uh, Oh, by the way, so when they repeat the step two and four, how many times of repetition? Uh, it's J. Uh, no, no, J is about iteration to train a model. But when, when, I mean the repetition is here. So if you consider this the student program, there are- Okay, how, do you mean how, how many times it needs to repeat, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's considered how, how the set of model you need to present, uh, produce. For example, you want to 80% of, of them to be pr uh, pruned, and you print it 5% of times, and it's 16 times. If you print 10 time, percent time of times, then it's eight times. So it, it depends on how many uh, parameters you need to prune it. Uh, for example, the, pro the parameters is S, right? The number of yeah. the parameters is in S. And how do we calculate the formula between S and the number of repetitions? 
So it's just p p times s, right? It's very simple. So p is your target. P, p over s. Yeah, p over s. P is your target. Uh, iteration. Uh, target. Uh, pruning percentage. S is our. Uh, s is. Oh, I got the, it. I got it. So you. So the p actually you are divided p into a set of s. Yeah, correct. So that is uh, that is the trick here. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the important is the re resetting here. This give a uh, better performance with continual training. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think you have no questions. Yeah. So is there anyone had a question here? Um. Yeah, I do have a question here. So, mm -hmm. um, is the purpose of the experiment to verify the Hypothesis. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So, so as you, you think you have already reviewed the partial answers, you're going to uh, later. So that means that means on j just the ranking, the prone the parameters getting their weight is not enough, right? Sometimes. Uh, can you repeat? It means that it means that. Compared to the first approach and the second one, the first approach just uh, proning the last uh, few, uh, the smallest uh, parameters, or just to remove the parameters with the uh, with the smallest value, and uh, and it just uh, just just have to just get a ticket, and uh, and for the second approach, it leaves it provide a diversified approach. Or provide um, a more confirmative approach to figure out which parameters are are the has the least significance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will compare with uh, resetting and the continued training. So this part is actually the same with the one of the first, and second one is here. So. So you can see the only difference is in step four. So there's a reset to the very P here, but there's no, there's no here. So it will just do the training and training. So after percent S of parameter are pruned in the strategy two, they will not reset the weight to zero, uh, theta zero, but then do the training and then prune it, train it, prune it. So there's no re re resetting part here. And finally, they create a winning tick, uh, create a ticket by this uh, theta zero. So that's the two difference. And they found the first one get a better one. So mm. yeah. I mean the reset reset provide more more advantage. Yeah, from the experiment, it is yes. Yeah, but actually it's also reasonable, right? So anyway, we are going to reset the values to theta zero in the very end. So if they can be reset it in the meanwhile, so maybe it will can give some more correct guides of the final structure and the, yeah. So that's my point. I think it also depends on how we initialize the theta zero, right? So actually the hypothesis is that no matter how we randomly initialize it, there exists. So this is a possible way to train it. Yeah. We have we somehow need to initialize it with some distribution, right? Yes, correct. The uniform distribution, the Gaussian distributions, or so to the extreme case, zero initialization leads us to nowhere. We cannot use zero initialization. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm just saying that. Uh, have a very just being uh, just being extremist a, a bit. Yeah. So, given that, so given the models, when we have initializations here, the idea is that after they train for a while, the purpose of training. Is not to adjust the weight. The purpose of training now becomes to figure out which parameters or which which parameters is of the least significance. Yeah. As long as we remove those least significance parameters, any initializations can do the trick. Yeah, correct. Uh, it sounds a little counterintuitive. It sounds a little bit counterintuitive. counterintuitive. So that means uh, that means. There, there exists an, an architecture or the model architecture. Once the architecture is fixed, whatever the value it is, we can always get a good result. Am I correct? 
Um, so here, actually, uh, the, the point in this paper is says that weight is important than architecture. Yeah, uh, architecture. Uh, yeah. But, uh, re really, I think it's, 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 it's the opposite. It so all, I see all, the reset here. So mm. the, this is a weight inheritance, right? Yeah, so the weight, the weight the because weight. In, you see, the, the theta zero is the weight from random initialization. Correct. And the theta j is the weight from training. You get my point? So yeah, it means that whatever we train the model, if as long as we um, prune the parameters and reset the theta j by theta zero, and they're supposed to be a winning ticket. So, so it, from my point of view, it inflicts the totally the opposite. The weights don't matter because whatever we trend, theta j does not play the role anymore. It is the, it's a theta j provide more roles here. So from my understanding, it will be the direction of it. As long as we- So actually, uh, the, hmm. so why we say the weights inheritance is more important is that, so actually uh, in this approach, it is, so the, the dependency is like this. So the theta zero result to our architecture instead of an architecture result as theta zero. So the point of this paper is that given a random theta zero, we can generate an architecture from this theta zero, but not the opposite. Given any architecture, we can find a theta zero. So let's go back to the, uh, so the motivation. So the motivation part here says that the contemporary experience is that the sparse architecture produced by unstructured pruning are difficult to train at start. So which means, what does this part, this sentence means? Is that, for example, we get a sparse structure by any way, like by any method, and we get a sparse structure on the right. Then if we just randomly initialize the weights here, like in all the black weights, and then we do the training, we'll find that the result is very bad. However, in this hypothesis, we, instead of random initializing these weights, we just reset this weight to the one that is random initialized. Then after certain rounds of retraining, we get a better result. Uh, Lin, do you got my point? I have a good point. The, yeah, so the, that's the, why- The argument, the argument is that, that if we fix the architectures, finding such a seed is difficult, but as long as we fix the seed, and we adapt to the architecture, it means it might provide a get a more chance to have a better yeah. accuracy. Yeah, correct. So that's why I say in this paper, they believe weight inheritance is a little bit important than the architecture itself. But actually your point is also correct. Yes, what I'm going to say in, the, in this paper in, in here. So actually there's another paper also in the same conference give a very opposite opinion of, the, of this paper. So, but uh, I will, Introduce this later, yeah, because I have um, the idea of this paper is I would like to say the idea of this paper is very novel and uh, it is thinking something out of the box. I have to admit that. Mm, maybe please go on, you can please go on. So, so whatever it is, so the takeaway is that giving a set of parameter initializations, we can evolve the architecture based on the initialization. However, yes, there are original. Yeah, but however, their their approach requires uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of computationally expensive. Yeah. Also, it's actually this the data set it used is not big enough. Mm -hmm. So we so it so we can see that the data set is used too small. So even the pruned model may be over para, para term, uh, yeah, over, over parameter, right? So that's one criticizing idea. So it's not start mm. experiment on ImageNet. And by the way, so do you know there is an open review for all the AI conference? I know, I know. So have you ever checked the, the review for this paper? I checked several, like, uh, especially for the for that paper. So that paper actually, they also, so actually, uh, this paper have re re referenced the paper I mentioned here, and as the paper mentioned here also referenced the uh, um, paper, uh, the notary ticket one. So actually they have uh, agreement. So the agreement is that for unstructured pruning, using a small learning rate, winning tickets is better than random initialization. 
but using a uh, standard learning rate, we need to get a dot helping. And for structured pruning, we need to get the dot help in both cases. So this is the result of uh, the paper in the, uh, the second paper they do, and also the so also of the ones that we are current I'm current presenting today also agree on. So they agree that uh, it's the win take strategy uh, is a little better if the learning rate is a little bit lower, like 0 0.01. But this is not actually the standard one. So to interpret this graph, so I think, so, uh, sorry. So to interpret this graph. I'm oh, sorry, I think, well, I, think I kind of lost in your, your more, you know, in your more over uh, slides. I have a few questions here. To, uh, uh, okay, let me introduce, uh, uh, the, um, just, just let me go through it one by one first, and then uh, mm. you can ask your questions. Mm. Okay, so <clears throat> so basically, there's two methods they are doing, uh, so resetting and continue training. And uh, actually, the experiment parts are very simple as just what I, I have said. So they just do five random seeds, and then they choose, uh, they train it. And then they found that so there at least one or two seeds seed generate a better ticket than the original model. Yeah, that's the experiment part. And uh, so the contribution it says is that as uh, the pruning uncovers the trainable sub, sub network has reached test accuracy comparable to the original network with a comparable number of iterations. So that's what the hypothesis says. And second is that uh, pruning finds Wintix that learns faster than the original model. So this also uh, yeah, so what's the hypothesis states? And the third one um, is- By actually, the way, so given the, the pruning, it's a purely random pruning, right? So there, anyway, so once there's a random sampling, it will be easier for us to uh, transferring, transfer the, the random proof into a search proof, as well as we provide some guidance. For example, when we observe that a certain weight, if we prune them, and it give us, it minimizes the gap between the, or it will show some promise of those, uh, those proning those weights or proning those parameters somehow or potentially contribute to the winning ticket. Then we can catch those proning process during the evolution or during the random sample. Have you yeah. ever think about it in such a way? The paper uh, doesn't mention, right? So the patient are just purely randomly pruning. They do not involve any search algorithm to do the job. I don't think it's random pruning. So I have mentioned that it's actually a standard pruning method. So it just cuts the uh, lower, lowest uh, percent of the magnitude. So it's not random searching. So they do not search, they just prune it. Mm. So from your point of view, is that possible that we, so if we do not prune the minimum weights, we prone the other ways. Is that possible that we um, have a better version of the model? What, so it depends on how can we uh, define the importance of the weights. Mm, but but uh, but from the traditional point of view or from the set of approach, how do they define the most significant or most important weights? Just so, based on the value of the weights. Uh, from from my research. So the, they just define it quite simply by its weight magnitude. So, yeah. Just by its value. Yeah, like, just by its it's, it's 0 0.1, it's, it's, it, it, it does not have value. It's, it's 10, it has more value, it's 100, it definitely is a significant value. Yeah, so that's how they define, yeah. So, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't saw any searching now, but it may be some, some searching yeah, methods. I, I, I know that there's a branch of research called the network or architecture evolution. So they, but of course they keep connecting or removing the waste between the neurons. And sometimes they even uh, using the cross layer edge. For example, the neurons, there's, the, there's one edge here. You will try to randomly add an edge across the layers to see yeah. whether this age can bring us some benefits. Yeah. So, so the waste is just there, the architecture is there, but during the trainings, they not only uh, look for how to adjust the weights, adjusting the parameters. They also 
look how to re rewire how to yes. rewiring. I, I also saw a paper that do mm -hmm. something like pruning plus weeds. So mm -hmm. they prune it to some uh, pruning to keep important weights, and then it weeds it to retrain the other ones, and uh, it may also give a better result or something like this. Yeah, but I'm not so good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go. So AutoML something to provide a, a rich a rich set of the facilities to allow the architecture evolution there. Yeah. So, mm. so the the five, the third point is actually most important. So it's uh it can give a, as a new perspective on the combination uh composition of neural networks, and also may explain why uh some models that have very huge parameters but still did not go over fifteen. Yeah, it may explain some hypothesis. I uh, may explain some ex uh phenomena in the AI, but yeah, just uh, if, but it's anyway just a hypothesis. Yeah. Mm. So next, I will talk about the criticizing idea, uh, crit crit criticizing point of this paper. So the first we may I mentioned is that the data set used is too small. So sorry to it, interrupt. So uh, I just I have one question. So yeah. just now you said. It can help to explain why some very large or deep neural network um, do not have a, the problem of overfitting. Yeah. So, yeah. Why? Why does this hypothesis can help explain this phenomenon? So, uh, it's mainly says that so. Uh, uh, let Let me recall. Mm -hmm. uh, so it means that. Uh, there's a subset of the network that is already doing the most important job. So the other parameter just doing nothing. So, and with this good initialization of, and uh, with the help of this good initialized subnetwork, the model can perform very good. Yeah, it's something like this. So one trying point is, I think one trying point is <clears throat> since a smaller, a smaller models can do the do the job. So if we involve additional parameters, those parameters get life by doing nothing but learning yeah. the noise. Yeah, yeah, I guess. yeah uh, but it's a, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's it's just 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 the point. It may explain. Yeah, it's it's not guaranteed to explain. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, so the model is like this. For for example, we have a key architecture, like some something like this is is is. Uh, like a very small network, it, and it can already do the uh, prediction very well, and uh, it will ignore the other. So the although other small network, oh, uh, there's some problem. So although the other model may attach some add some noise here, but because the original submodel is already give a very good uh, generalization of the prediction. This overfitting that will not influence the final prediction. Yeah. So we sometimes we do not observe a guaranteed overfitting of the model. Yeah, because they already attract in a very good generalized local min minimum and is not influenced by this bias because of this good random initialized submodel. Uh, your point is that so. So as long as we have a core, let's call the subset of the parameters which can still do the best job as a core of the network. As long yeah. as, one time means that as long, as long as the core is fixed, introducing additional parameters into the core will not lead to the overfitting phenomenon. Will not lead to like will not in that so will not lead to overfitting in that extent. So it will lead to overfitting, of course, but the result won't be such obvious. Yeah, that's what they say now. So, yeah. Uh, yeah but, uh, but anyway, it's, 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 it's not related to the, yeah, it's not so related yeah, to the, Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. So I still have some concern continue, on yeah. such an argument, but I can still content about the criticizing idea. I think Wang Tao provided a very good example. So when we talk about the AI communities uh, papers, there's open 
open review there, that means when this paper get accepted, sometimes some paper, even the best paper, have some point to be criticized. And this, let alone some borderline paper. Borderline paper means that some paper get accepted, but with some very, with an arguable, with some heat debate. And finally, maybe three reviewers that support it and two reviewers against. So even the paper get accepted, we will not look upon, will not look up for it. We wouldn't fix the, the, the hole, the weakness of the papers. So we can stand, we can stand on, on the higher ground and looking for different researchers and their work. Okay, one more please go on. So the first is that the data set used is too small. So if even the pruned model may be over parameterized. So what it means here is that so it's it's is so maybe even we prune the eighty percent of the models, the rest twenty percent is also doing the overfitting job. So it does not mean nothing. Or uh, so it cannot say that this uh, ticket is a winning ticket because its ticket is already have a uh, ability of it. If we have some some distribution like this. Uh, like, like this, and the standard is like this. So we can say that it's a winning ticket, right? However, if so already model requirement is here, we cannot say these two are winning tickets because both now all five of them are already gaining the ability to print them well. So this hypothesis may not be true because- uh, So the height of your distribution means accuracy? There's the accuracy, yeah. Means accuracy, you mean the winning tickets for example is 98% of accuracy? And the rest of the eighty percent accuracy. Yeah, something what, like this. What, what do you mean by uh, the eighty percent of the tickets? Eighty percent. Oh, sorry, the tickets reaching eighty percent of the accuracy is still a winning ticket compared to comparing to. Okay, so tickets. so I mean, after, uh, so this this is true. Actually, not uh, the same thing. So I mean, so there are five. For for example. For our for our rest the model, we prune eighty percent of the model uh, of, of the weights, and there are only twenty percent of model remaining. And for this, like there are five ways of pruning, and then for these five models, it may have the final training accuracy as this. Mm. Yeah. So, so if if uh, I mean that uh, the uh, the overfitting line is or or the normal normal line is list here, it means that we are actually get some getting some tickets that is above the the baseline, or we can see that. You mean, you, so, so let me repeat it. So you mean that after, so here the data set is, is too small and the prone model is too large. Oh, the model is too large. So yeah, the model even, is so large that even the prone version is over, is still, is still over large. So, yeah, the point may, that may the, so the point is that the winning ticket they selected may be overfitting. Yeah, yeah. It, so all the tickets are, are overfitting. So we cannot say, yeah, we are actually, this is actually doing some improvement. Yeah, that's mm. what is critical. But there's supposed to be the training ticket. There's a training of valid validation they set, right? There's a validation accuracy. So as long as the validation accuracy are largely pre preserved, it means that there is no overfitting issue. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not talking about. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the overfit. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's just to explain that why it may still be over parameterized because the rest that itself is too big and the data set is too small. Yeah, it's, it's the example. It's just, just to explain this point. Yeah. So it's but. And the another also have do experiment on a larger data set in the genet, and I will talk talk about it later. Yep, that's the one point. And the second is that the model needs to be warmed up, like per trained for several approaches for larger models to create a successful winning winning uh winning ticket. That's also what you may uh you may just say. So actually, for very large models, random uh sorry, it's not random. So just pruning, so just doing the method alone may not help, uh, like cannot find uh, any winning tickets by, by, by winning. So it has to be warmed up. So the warmed up here just means uh, per train for several rounds. Yeah, so that's another point here. So it says the large models need to be warmed up. So yeah, it's also in the paper. It says it needs to be, uh, it's, uh, they are strategic 
uh, mm -hmm. provided. This cannot... one it sounds more like a suggestion, comments instead of a criticism, cr criticized one, right? So it will have provide suggestions that uh, the pure randomizations may not so reliable. So so, so reliable. So, so yeah, one, uh, because one uh, of, uh, of it, it may help. Mm. So so uh, actually, it's not a uh, actually this. Uh, this is the observation mentioned by the pro uh, author of this paper. He said that the model needs to be warm up. So remember that the paper is actually more about talking about a hypothesis. And uh, the strategies is actually need to use to verify this hypothesis. So we cannot say the hypothesis is not true because the strategy used is not good enough. Yeah, but anyway, they, they said that the strategy is not good to find a winning ticket. Uh, where the model is too large. Yeah. Mm. Uh, do you got my point? I fully got a point. So yeah. yeah, so I think this paper may lead to may lead to a set of new papers to um, to investigate how to warm up a little bit. You know what is the best initializations? If yeah. initialization can lead to an arbitrary uh, a specified pruned network, and also I think there are other points maybe. So given even if the initialization is perfect, uh, how do we think about what is the best, uh, what is the most significant parameters apart from those value-based, uh, naive but value-based pronouns, whether it's possible that we can remove some methods with large value, right? So that is still an open question there. Yeah, it's an open question. And the third point is that the pruning method used in that paper does not use a standard learning rates. So I will, which I will explain it in the next part. So, um, so for the learning rate here, it means that there are actually a standard learning rate to do doing the, for all these rest at VGG models, which is 0 0.1. So this actually is a very standard one. So the model, however, uh, the also used the 0 0.01. Uh, so these are actually two different words. So we may observe that when the we need so when the like the we need take it rate is zero point zero one. Um, I, by the way, I, I have to stop you here. So what do you, what do you mean by the random initialization learning rate, or what do you mean by the learning rate for random initialization? Okay, so remember that what what's in our hypothesis, right? So random initialization means that the we have a we have a structure, and the structure is reset it by the original weights. The random initialization means that we have a structure, but the structure is just randomly initialized. So which is said to be hard to train. But in this, in the new paper, I, I mentioned that it says that the structure is more important than the weight inheritance. So it holds a totally opposite opinion of the current paper. So this paper is actually proposed by, uh, uh, let, let me record. It's, it's proposed by Peking University and Berkeley. Uh, University uh, would you of, please share the paper? The, the, the I, paper I, I will do it after the, the yeah. I will do it after. Here. So there's a criticizing, but I think it's, yeah. good. it's good that, for example, suppose you and I are two different researchers. You propose yes. once and it get published. And then I, then I disagree with you. We publish another paper. So we too. But actually, they are uh, publishing on the same same web. Yeah. Actually, they are publishing on the yeah, same yeah, I understand. Uh, so, same conference. And actually, they got an agreement on the learning rate part. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so the result in that paper or image net is that like for unstructured pruning, using a smaller learning rate, winning tickets helps. Yeah, it's better than the random initialization, but using a standard learning rate, mean ticket is not helping. Yeah, that's uh, actually- Wait, so the random initialization means, means the, red, the, the random initializations on the whole architecture? No, of the pruned architecture. Oh, the pruned architecture. So then after we, after we are pruned, the winning tickets, um, but the winning tickets is still a specified, a, a special random, it's still, it's still initialized in a random way, right? Yeah, it's a win. Yeah, it's 
it's kind of uh, randomized, but it's but not totally when, when randomized. Which is more specified of the difference? The uh, getting the winning winning ticket. That means I uh, prone the giving in in the prone. So for example, we have a mm -hmm. uh, parameter theta, mm -hmm. and after pruning, we got the theta, uh, theta minus. Mm -hmm. And uh, for winning tickets, this theta minus, uh, all the ones that is not mask is is equal to this one. Yeah. For example, that mask mm -hmm. and after the mask, so all the remaining one is yeah is equal to one. theta zero. Yeah, yeah. But for this random initialization, it means that now we get a mask. Then yeah. for all the ones that is not masked, we we do the another theta. We will generate another random initialization. So mm -hmm. the now the this theta will do not have any difference with uh, do not have any relationship with this theta. So mm -hmm. it only cares about the m. Yeah, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. So they are doing the same mask, but this for the winning text one, it will inherit the weight. From the original random initialized settings. And the difference means that some the first the former inheritance the 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 the, the, the initialized parameters and the, the yeah, latter correct. actually reinitialize. So I think yeah, maybe a, a better term here is called a random reinitialization. Okay, can it's better than random reinitialization? Yeah. So it in the paper and it's an experiment on the image net. Sorry. So it says that for unstructured pruning, a smaller learning rate under a smaller learning rate, winning tickets helps, but using a standard learning rate, it does not help. Me. Yeah, that's what's mentioned. And actually, the author of this paper also agree on the paper in that. Yeah, so a learning rate is very important. So let me uh, introduce. So yeah, so actually, it's, it's, it's quite easy to observe the difference. So from the paper, we can see for the, all the ones with a uh, smaller learning rate. So the yeah. point, uh, so the point, let me reconfirm the last slide. Let me reconfirm one point last slide, the previous slide. Okay. Uh, the previous slide here, you mean the winning tickets are not helping. The winning tickets are not helping means that the winning tickets will not outperform the random reinitialization. Yes. So it also means that uh, with a standard learning rate, it almost makes no difference between the winning ticket and the yes, random correct. reinitializations. Correct. That also imply that only sure. the architecture matters. Yeah, correct. The way it's method does not that matter. Yeah. So actually, it's the opinion is very opposite. Yeah, it's so, very, it's very counterintuitive. It's very counterintuitive. I, I, I have no comments on that. Yeah. Being so I will publish later. Yeah. So that's that's the last paper. So I will just introduce it quickly. So, <clears throat> so you can see there are four lines here. So the first, the solid one, is uh, standard learning rate, as the dashed one is. Um, a uh, smaller learning rate. So we can observe that in all scenarios with a smaller learning rate, we, uh, they do got to outperform the red one, like you can see in all four graphs. But with a standard one, 0 0.1, actually you can see the two lines are toggled. So uh, there's no much difference. Yeah, that's basically the, their findings. Yeah, I think that should be all for my presentation today. Uh, do you have any questions? Hmm. I think you made a very good presentation, and uh, also it's very good to bring on the the point from the open open reviews. And I think all the follow up the uh, all the follow up search apart from of course this would be better if you can raise more questions to the students. Uh, to Xiangling, Rofan. I sorry, I, I, how, I, I forgot that, to that, do so. Yeah. Yeah. So so that, so but anyway, so it's it's quite good. And also, so one of the questions, my last question for this kind of opens. So what do you think your FYP research, uh, the relation between the FYP research and the pronings? And do you think whether there's an idea we can borrow from this proning work? Mm, actually, for now, we are more focusing on the sampling part instead of pruning part. So maybe we can use the pruning and the redance Part 
mentioned, but I'm not sure it will work. Yeah, yeah proning is somehow, uh, from my point of view, proning is somehow a special form of the model evolution. Uh, yeah. you can consider you can consider the the dropout is a specialized proning during training stage, right? right? But now we are supposed to prone some waste. And uh, from my point of view, one major advantage of proning is to avoid overfitting. So we can remove a lot of noisy data, of course. The argument for when we have a small model so then fitting by IoT is still a, a good argument. But from my point of view, removing the data, removing some weights, is <clears throat> is largely on for avoiding overfitting. I think a proning the, the idea of the pronings might be useful if your current work became successful. If it became successful, that, that means that we significantly improve the model predicting accuracy from 75% to 95%. In this case, we have a concern whether we using some approach makes the model overfit. By okay. this means we can further adopt some prone approach, borrow the idea of the prone approach, maybe following the, the process and algorithm pr pr proposed here to further reduce the model size and to, to control the overfitting phenomena. So that is what I, that's what in my mind. Okay. Okay, so hopefully your FYP uh, <clears throat> research can gain and new achievements and make new progress. Let's keep making more, more frequent. Mm. Okay, the next one is supposed to be Nima. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, the work of Nima is going to learn <clears throat> how the network can learn, can be, it may not be using the neural network model, right? But anyway, so before we are applying AI model in some real world scenarios, like cyber security, uh, like some, 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 some commercial scenarios, we usually have to model the, the input, to model the input or embed the input, for example, for the natural language sentence, we have to embed a sentence into a vector so that the machine learning model or the deep learning model can take effects. And here, this work is somehow to propose a um, representation for network traffic. So, and this paper is published in some top tier uh, security conferences. And let, let's let Nima to introduce us about the details. So uh, today I'm going to present uh, the following paper, optimized invariance representation of network traffic for detecting unseen malware variants. So this paper deals about a new way to represent network flows to detect malware activity. So first, uh, let's take a look at the researchers who wrote uh, the paper. Uh, the main one is uh, Kare Bartos. So uh, he has a PhD in computer science and uh, his thesis was about uh, uh, this uh, subject. Um, so we can say that he's uh, specialized in uh, this do domain. Um, he was working at Cisco and uh, currently he has created a company which is specialized, specialized in detecting uh, threat, uh, threats uh, with AI. So uh, yeah. Uh, the second one uh, is uh, specialized in deep learning. Uh, and uh, uh, it's the same for the third one. And uh, also, they are all from the same uh, university. One check. Uh, yeah. yeah. OK. So this is uh, the agenda of the presentation. Uh, so first, let's take a look, uh, a look at the motivation of such technique. Um, there are different ways to do traffic, network traffic analysis. Uh, one way is to inspect packets. 
So um, it means that we look at each packet later. So today, this method is quite difficult to perform because uh, there are high speed uh, networks. So uh, it requires a lot of resources to analyze each packet data. And uh, moreover, in uh, banks, for example, uh, there are sensitive data. So uh, it can be a problem to inspect uh, the packets. Uh, the second uh, method is a signature matching. Uh, the problem with this method is that it won't detect new malwares. Um, um, only malware for which we have a signature. So yeah. And uh, the other way, which will be used in this paper as a baseline, is uh, flows. So um, uh, yeah. So basically, flows are represent uh, groups of packets. Uh, we'll see uh, a bit later what uh, they are exactly. Um, and the main motivation uh, in this paper is to um, to um, uh, is to is that uh, new malware families are released frequently, and uh, flow detectors fail to detect unseen malware families. They have a poor perf poor performance, so uh, it performs uh, well on already seen malwares, but uh, not very well on uh, new ones. And uh, the paper formalize, formalizes this problem and uh, tries to handle it with a new representation. Uh, so first of all, what are our flows? So uh, uh, each HTTP flow is a group of packets from a user to a particular host name. Uh, so here are the fields that are mentioned in the paper, which are examples. And uh, here we, get, we can uh, see uh, uh, the example of uh, four flows. Uh, yep. So now uh, let's move on to the uh, new representation, uh, which is proposed uh, by the author of the paper. Uh, um, yeah. So first, uh, the researchers uh, introduce a new term, which is a bag. Uh, a bag is simply a collection of multiple flows from uh, one user to one host name in a given amount of time. Um, then uh, they design a transformation to apply to these bags in order to make these data invariant to multiple transformations. Mm. Yeah, so as I stated, the goal is to detect new malware families that were previously unseen. So the researchers identify this as a domain adaptation problem. And uh, they wanted to design a transformation that must be make the data invariant to multiple operations, which are scaling, shifting uh, of the feature values, and permutation and size changes of the bags. So this should allow this representation to capture the dynamic within a bag, uh, and then to detect, uh, to better detect malwares. So we well, really have uh, an example of what do you mean by scaling, shifting, and, uh, and how uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, mm. I have a, mm. in the next slide. Um, yeah, so uh, here is an example. Uh, it's not an example, it's a defi the definition. And, uh, it's uh, what the transformation they used. So to make uh, first uh, scaling variance is simply achieved by scaling each feature data. So um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I will explain uh, later uh, why, uh, why uh, they wanted uh, this. Then um, that's uh, the most interesting uh, thing. Um, uh, they achieved they achieve the shift invariance by computing a self-similarity matrix uh, of each feature. Uh, this means that uh, for each feature, um, uh, we, we compute this matrix, uh, which uh, contains uh, the distances between all the flow values uh, for the for a corresponding feature. So, um, sorry. Uh, so this matrix is only for a single feature. Uh, yep. 
but uh, they so, compute it for every feature. I understand. So, so can you specify the lines and the, and which line, which, which, which is the row stand? Each row stand for uh, a traffic, and all uh, the, the package, uh, and the, uh, the column represents for the package, and the row represents for the traffic. Uh, here, the matrix contains uh, the, the distances between uh, two uh, two uh, data from uh, different uh, uh, flows within a bag. Different so, flow within a bag. So, uh, sorry, sorry. Would you please go back for a definition of the bag? The bag, according uh, if I remember correctly, a bag is defined as a collection of flows. And how do we define yeah, flows? Correct. A flow is a uh, is uh, just like uh, a vector with uh, with uh, information about uh, the metadata of a particular connection to uh, from a user to a particular host name. A flow is a group of packets or a sequence of packets. Yeah, yeah. It's a sequence of group. So does the order matters in the flow? Uh, uh, could you repeat, please? Uh, so. A flow is actually uh, a group of packets, right? But according to uh, uh, intuitively, yeah. the packets can't can't live within uh, with order in order. So in when we define that, anyway, so a bag is a group of. Oh blocks. yeah, okay. And uh, a, yeah, it is a sequence. Yes, it's a sequence of packets. Yes, and yes. Uh, and the field and the field here actually are specified of packets. Instead of a flow, right? Hello. Uh, uh, could, uh, could you repeat, please? Uh, my question is: You have listed a, a list of fields here. You have. Uh, listed, yep. You have it's... listed a, a list of fields here, and the, yep. those fields are not specified to a certain flow. It is specified a certain package. A certain package. Uh. So that's a feature. This this that's not a feature for flow. That's a feature for packets. Uh, it is a feature for flow. It's a feature for flow. Um, yeah. uh, why? So those features because hmm. when uh, for example, if we take the first flow, uh, we may have uh, multiple packets that are resulting of uh, of this connection. And they, they will all have the same uh, IP, URL, user agent, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we even have the duration, which is uh, okay, so it means the time between the first and the uh, right, It's more, more like an aggregation. And the packets yep. flow share the same yes. <clears throat> the source and destination. Yeah. <clears throat> it's uh, total destination. Mm. Correct. Okay. Mm. okay. So, Remember, so a bag is a group of flow. Um, so uh, another question here, and how do we define the size of bag? And more like segment. Uh, we don't. Do we have a do, that also <clears throat> will segment the, the number of flow? Uh, we and don't how, directly how, define uh, the size of the bag, but yes. uh, it is defined for a certain amount of time. Mm. So uh, yeah. And, and giving the metric, the each entry, in the metric is for bag. Um, it does also specify how do they group flows into a bag. <clears throat> uh, they may just have uh, the same, uh, the same, um, uh, the same uh, host uh, destination, mm. and uh, yeah. Okay. Please and it on. must be from uh, one from the same user to the same destination. Okay. Please go on. Okay, so so first, yeah, we scale uh, all uh, the uh, all the uh, feature values, and then we compute an, a matrix. So in this matrix, we put the distance between uh, each feature value for uh, for uh, some feature. So um, if we compute all the uh, no, okay, uh, this is like the uh, uh, summary. So, from uh, from the flows, we scale the values. 
and then we compute the matrix. Uh, we'll see an exam a real uh, example later. Um, yeah, so to achieve a uh, size and permutation of variance within a bag, um, uh, the, the paper introduced uh, histograms. So histograms are used to bo for both uh, the scale data and the matrix elements. So what we are doing is we take all the scale data and we do an histogram uh, with uh, this data. And uh, for the matrix, uh, we take uh, all the matrix elements. So to be precise, we take the upper di diagonal elements uh, because the matrix is symmetric. And then we do an histogram. Mm. So one uh, in interesting point uh, in the paper is how uh, how did how uh, they get the histogram parameters, uh, so which are the number of bins and the bin sizes, uh, knowing that the bin sizes are not necessarily uniform. So the researchers give the method uh, to optimize these parameters to increase the separability of the data. Uh, we'll see later on uh, the results on the experiments. Uh, but I won't give uh, the details about uh, it uh, because uh, it's not uh, really linked uh, to it's just uh, a tool to for this representation. But uh, I, I can uh, give you the intuition. Uh, what they are doing is that uh, they are taking a huge amount of bins and then uh, they, they merge them uh, in order to minimize a, a loss function. Mm. Okay, so now, no, uh, I let's no, I take a look. No, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, please go on, please go on. Okay, okay. So this is a, uh, a summary of the representation. So for each feature, so first we scale, and then for each feature, we compute first the histogram, then the matrix and the histogram of the, the upper, uh, upper element of the matrix. And then we concatenate, and we concatenate uh, for all features. And we, are, we have uh, then the, the final uh, feature vector. Mm -hmm. uh, is this part uh, clear? Mm. So let me think about it. So given a very long sequence of traffic, how do they separate them into flow? And uh, for uh, now, they, it's, it seems that given a traffic, it only looks into different features, right? Only looks into different features and they aggregate the traffic on in terms of features and align all the features together. So it's more like it's going to aggregate on, it's going to ag it somehow aggregate the features of every flows uh, in the traffic. Mm. Uh, uh, let me take uh, an example maybe. Okay. Uh, yep, so this is an example of uh, two uh, malwares. Uh, so, the, uh, these two malwares are generating two bags because uh, the, uh, the destination host names are different. Mm. Yeah. So uh, here, um, for the sake of simplicity, uh, this example, for this example, we only take the URL, URL length as the uh, feature. So, um, we compute uh, for each for each of the flow. We compute the features, mm. and the goal would be to have a representation which uh, makes these two vectors similar, in order to recognize uh, to detect uh, the to detect the the malware. Mm. So. At step three, we apply the transformation. So first we are doing uh, the histograms and we are computing uh, the uh, self-similarity matrix. 
mm. and we can actually see uh, like uh, that it's symmetric and uh, that the diagonal is uh, zero oh, yeah. because uh, it's uh, mm. the distance. So, will you explain why the uh, two matrix looks different? This one and this one. Uh, the interesting thing is that they are different because here we are we are uh, computing the mm. the uh, distance between, for example, uh, oh, so yeah, there, oh, actually, got it. There are five, there's five, there's five cases, and they, they, uh, the, yep. the, the, the yep. left one. Has, so the left one has three, right? The left no, the left one has it also has two. See, it's the forty-five and the forty-seven, and this is. 55 and 53. And why uh, uh, why the why the metric here have five values and the metric in the left have two values? Uh, the fact is that uh, for example, if we take uh, this one, uh, it's the distance between uh, this one and this one, so it's two. And uh, here, uh, two is uh, yellow. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got, and, a, point. I got a point. It's always five. And only so the, the blue somehow means zero, right? The blue means yeah, zero. Blue is zero. Ye the yellow means non zero. So we got a uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, it's the same. So uh, if we take this one, it's uh, the distance uh, between this one and yeah, this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I somehow got a point. Mm. And, the, and the, the whole point of the paper is that. Even though the matrix are different, are different, their histogram looks very similar. Actually, here they are the same. Okay, so, the history means zero and a one, right? So you mean the number of zero and a one? Somehow you aggregate. Uh, yep, it. yep. Mm. But it's not just the number of zero and one. It's uh, because we can uh, we can uh, I just, yeah, uh, we can, change we can the play. parameters. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. We can we can do this. Uh, my next question is, uh, giving so the for the step one, it is bag or it is a flow. Uh, this is a bag. This is a bag, and uh, this is a flow. Okay. Uh, but the the fact is that we say that a flow is a group of packets because uh, for this uh, request to be uh, achieve, we we need uh, like uh, many TCP uh, packets. Mm. Now here the point is that getting, how do we when we train a model we usually sample for example uh, the deep learning task introduced by one cloud just now each image is uh, simple right and uh, the one of the very different features in your setting is that the traffic can be arbitrary long can be arbitrary long and how do we segment the flow and how do we segment the bag and how do we decide we can put a set of the flow into a bag mm, uh, the bags are not arbitrary large like the, mm. the in the author definition uh we restrict uh, all these flows uh, to be in a certain amount of time. So if uh, we have a new uh, a new flow, mm. which has uh, the same, uh, let's say uh, this is a new flow, and it has the same uh, host name, etc. But uh, it it uh, it comes uh, too long after uh, the last one. It will create a new bug. Uh, so you mean if you based on a different URL, it will create a. Uh, uh, if we have a different URL, it will create a new bug. But if it's the same, but uh, the time between uh, the last one of the mm. of uh, the current ba bug for this host name and uh, the new flow is too is too uh, big, it will create a new bug. So basically, it's compare the histogram of the feature, the the I, I mean the com combinations of the first yeah. calculate the histogram of every feature, then combine the feature together to 
to, to translate a bag of the traffic, a bag of the flow into a, a high dimensional vector. Yep. So mm. what if what if sometimes the traffic, given the traffic, it may have a lot of bags. It may have a lot of bags, or each bag it may have a lot of flows. So the scale is may, may, may be different. For example, for this tuple, what if it has 100 value? And for this tuple, what if it only has three value? And it will definitely derive very different histograms. And how does also address this problem? Uh, I think this problem is solved by your simply scaling, like your here, all, all, all our values are between uh, are uh, between zero and one. Yeah, I understand all the values between zero, definitely. So you can see even the forty five and forty seven, and the definite place it's using some some normalization technique to 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 to, to transform into the histogram. So for one hundred, it will still normalize. The three it will be normalized. So in in it, it uh, you feel that it is strange. If the number of bags are very different, which makes the histograms a little bit ineffective, because for as a, as a uh, you mean the number of uh, flows? Yeah, the number. Uh, yes, the number of flows in the bag in, in the bag. So once mm. so once the flow is different, the distribution looks very different. You know the different even for the same malware. The bag with one hundred malware flows will be looks different from the bags with only three uh, malware flows. And you know, how does the author address this problem? Mm. Uh, actually, uh, that's one of the limits of uh, the paper. Uh, mm. If uh, if there are not enough uh, flows within the bag, um, the bag may lack. Uh, May uh, how to say that? It may have a, a very static behavior, which uh, yeah. So uh, it's a limit of the uh, of the paper. If you uh, we'll see that uh, later if you want. Okay, sure. Uh, okay. So uh, ah. Okay. Uh, Yeah, uh, let me. Mm. So, uh, a question could be uh, why uh, why does this new representation require these uh, invariant properties? Uh, so the researchers' goal was to keep the data invariant to. Uh, to the following uh, changes to the uh, to the uh, flows, so uh, we can take uh, them uh, one by one, but uh, it's quite uh, straightforward. For the first one, uh, it's a common uh, thing we have with malware. So when uh, the uh, the payload inside is mo modified or obfuscated. So this uh, is used to bypass like uh, signature-based uh, methods, and um, for this method, it has no influence because uh, we we don't uh, look at the data inside uh, inside the packets. We only use the uh, the metadata like uh, the headers, so uh, it's uh, it's granted. Uh, if the server or host name is changing. Uh, that's the whole, uh, the whole uh, uh, point of uh, this bag representation. Within a bag, we have the same domain, so the same uh, host name. So uh, if it changes, uh, the bag should have similar uh, feature vector uh, as the previous ones, as uh, the structure should remain the same. So it's exactly like the example we have seen here, uh, this uh, matrix and uh, its histogram helps to characterize like the dyna dynamic inside the bag 
and uh, with the same domain, uh, even if it change changes, uh, it will pro produce a similar representation. Uh, for for the ter third one, uh, if you change the uh, URL path for the file name for a download, uh, it's uh, nearly the same. It's uh, when we are within uh, within each bag, the variability of the feature should remain constant. So um, again, uh, we are capturing the dynamic thanks to this uh, matrix. And uh, we should have a, a similar uh, feature vector. Mm. And uh, uh, for the number of flows and the ordering of the flows, uh, it's the point uh, of using histograms. But uh, as you have uh, uh, said, uh, if there are uh, a very low number of flows, it might be a limit, and uh, we'll see that later. OK. So uh, do you have a question so far? I, I don't have the questions. I think we can borrow some idea of the. So uh, I, I think from my point of view, the key point here that it's going to capture the distribution of the flow inside the bag, right? In terms of future, I mean the future difference. The future, um, I mean, yeah. given the each feature, uh, all the flows inside a package will form a distribution. Uh, yeah. Will form a distribution. Uh, actually, and, there and is a and this distribution yeah. is more like uh, the 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 rel the relevant distribution, and how each day samples are are related mm. or different with each other, and based on this structure, yeah. it's going to compare how each feature. Is a little bit different from the others, so it's more mm -hmm. like embedding. It's more like a, a embedding technique. So it, this reminds me of a technique called called a hog vector. That it was uh, that it was looks kind of similar. Of uh, I don't know it. Uh, the hog could you uh, write uh, it? It's called a hog vector. The hog vector. I think they adopt a similar idea. This also had a histogram. It also has a histogram. The idea is going to capture the the features or the most capture the 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 object in the picture. It's more like analyze the signals from the pictures and which part of the picture is the most salient. And when we are trying to match mm -hmm. a picture, whether a picture contains on some object like the pedestrian, or there's a dog inside a picture, so it's going to extract the features. From each, uh, from a set of pixel. In that case, a bag contains a set of pixel, and they extract the, They will analyzing the. They will extract the histogram of the pixel in, in, in a bag. But in the in the in the computer vision technique, it's not called a bag. It's called a. It's somehow called a, a sliding window. Inside a sliding sliding window, yeah. it will summarize the histogram of the. Summarize the, the summarize the histogram from each sliding windows, so they will compare the features of the sliding windows to to do the trick. Okay, okay, yes. So uh, mm. we might uh, inspire, uh, mm. also, but uh, there is a problem actually with uh, mm. this work. Uh, yeah, is that it's a. Mm. Uh, Mm. It, it does not work with uh, HTTPS and uh, mm. encrypted. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So let's let let's keep. So I'm a little bit curious about how uh, the authors, because this paper has been published in some top tier security conference. Um, just from the technical part, I think it is not so 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 enlightening. May not be so enlightening mm. because we can think about it with such a technique ourselves. So I'm a little bit curious about how the author uh, did the experiment to get the paper accepted. Uh, yeah, actually, the experiment was uh, was uh, quite impressive. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, jump to it. So uh, uh, how did they evaluate this approach? So uh, this evaluation is built on a large scale evalu evalu evaluation data sets on of uh, real world network traffic of multiple companies. 
Mm. So uh, as the researchers were from Cisco, I suspect they used like uh, the, uh, the logs from a Cisco products to conduct uh, it. Like we have seen uh, in the previous paper with, uh, with uh, Simon Tech. So uh, the training and testing data sets contain a lot of malicious and legitimate bugs. So these are all the numbers. Uh, there is a K. And uh, it is very important to note that uh, in a, a testing data set, new malware families are present. So uh, there are malware families that were not in the training data set. So it will be used to, to uh, evaluate if uh, this uh, new method can uh, help uh, detecting with uh, detecting uh, new uh, families. Oh, sorry, uh, there are questions last yeah. slide. So you mean it has 241K bags with new malware families. Uh, so it means that those new ones, uh, so given the invariance, what is the model is used to make the prediction? Yeah, uh, it's a be... simple uh, SVM. Uh, uh, okay, SVM. it's the simple SVM to say it is yes or no, right? Yeah. Correct. Okay, so this somehow means that I find a new mal malware variant which is similar to an existing malware. Yep. Okay. Yep. Anyway, so uh, there is an, an interesting uh, representation. Okay. Yep. Okay, given those new malware families, so the authors are deliberately collected and put them into the testing data set. Uh, I don't know if it's deliberate, yeah, but so I think so. so yes, yes. So somehow, you mean the 27K, right? Yep, yep. It is K, otherwise it's a little strange. Okay. I think this, uh, this yes. and if they are using SVM, this approach is, looks very much like a hog vector. Hog vector is a computer vision technique published 20 years ago. Uh, okay, so yeah. Uh, so this is uh, the setup they uh, they were using in uh, companies to collect uh, the data. So uh, basically, they, they use a proxy server that uh, saved uh, mm. saved the, uh, the data. Okay. So first, uh, the researchers compared the. Um, TSNE 2D projection of uh, the feature vectors using first the flow representation, so in the left, and uh, with the new transformation in the right. Uh, what was very interesting is that uh, we can see that uh, the flow representation can be used to train classifiers specialized on uh, some malware categories. Um, because we can suppose that uh, different crust clusters are actually uh, malware categories. If we want to identify all malware, uh, it seems very difficult with the flow representation. But uh, with, what uh, do you mean by the flow presentation? It just means to turn each packet into a, into a feature? Uh, basically, what they, what they have done is that they have computed uh, only the, f the flow representation. It seems they, they have not uh, uh, computed their uh, new transformation. Mm. And then uh, they have uh, computed this projection. OK. So it's showing that the aggregation uh, seems a little bit affected. Seems more effective. Yep. For, okay. What is very interesting is that with the new transformation, they are able to capture uh, so the whole group of malware, not uh, only families. So they are able to uh, to build a classifier that uh, mm. will have better chance to recognize. Uh, New malware families. Okay. Any explanations for why aggregations can make 
the malware feminist looks more similar. Uh, they did not provide a, an explanation. Um, okay, please go on. The, the only thing is the intuition that uh, that uh, this representation is able to capture uh, the dynamic within the bag. And that, uh, and that uh, these dy dynamics uh, are actually uh, characterizing uh, some malware uh, behaviors. Um, yeah, this is a, we have an example of multiple uh, uh, URLs uh, that, are, that are used by uh, malwares. So th th these two are from malwares. And uh, these two are from legitimate traffic. And uh, if we group uh, them, uh, if we consider that uh, this is a bag, this is a bag, and uh, these two are also bags, mm. uh, we can see that uh, the malware are, are quite, uh, they have a similar URLs. And that legitimate traffic has a uh, different one. Like, uh, this is much more variable. And uh, this is the, their intuition. Okay, please go on. This is the intuition of uh, why they use uh, this. Mm. Okay. Okay. So uh, for the evaluation, uh, they first they computed the rock curve for the, for the test data. Uh, so they use the simple SVM classifier with uh, two, class, two, two classes. And uh, uh, the, uh, the main takeaway is that uh, the flow-based representation shows uh, weak results show, uh, showing that uh, flow-based representation approach cannot be applied in practice to detect uh, unseen malware variants. Uh, and that's uh, their transformation which is the red one, uh, lead to uh, to better uh, better results. Mm. So um, the other, uh, uh, let me explain. So uh, basically, the the uh, blue one is uh, what we have seen. So uh, if we take uh, the two histograms. Uh, the purple one and the uh, green one, as are, uh, if we take uh, uh, one of the histograms, so uh, if we take this one or, or this one, and uh, they say optimized but combined because uh, they have uh, optimized the histogram uh, parameter selection. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, and uh, their second uh, uh, graph uh, for evaluating the method is the precision recall curve. And uh, if we take the red curve, which is the optimized, uh, where we optimize the histogram, histograms, uh, we have, uh, we, we can uh, pinpoint a trade off uh, with 90% uh, precision and uh, 60. 67% uh, recall, which is a... Uh, okay. Uh, okay, keep going on. Okay. So, uh, oh. yeah. So their evaluation so, uh, is kind of a thing for, I think this is a, supposed to be a top tier conference. Um, okay, please go on. I just feel that their evaluation is a little thing for, not sure how they got into Usenix. I think maybe that's a, that's a Usenix. Uh, five years ago, mm. uh, it was in uh, mm. uh, sixteen. I think. Yeah, sixteen. Yeah, please go on. Let's finish these presentations. Okay. Mm. So um, there are actually three uh, three limitations. So uh, first, uh, with HTTPS, this don't this uh, method uh, does not work mm. because URLs are encrypted. So uh, there are uh, the features. Uh, are not the same. Uh, 
mm. we, uh, with HTTPS, we may have to change uh, something. Uh, someone, actually, uh, the author uh, did uh, a presentation of uh, his work. And he was asked uh, how uh, he was about to deal with uh, HTTPS. And uh, he told that it was uh, confidential for now. And uh, I have not seen uh, any uh, recent paper that, that uh, have uh, ex extend uh, this work. So uh, I don't know if he has uh, succeeded or not. OK, so I think we should look into so. I was always thinking about our traffic classifications, our our traffic classifications aim to explaining some aim to explain something. Um, especially about the users' concerns. Um, and also if it's possible, so we are aiming for some commercial market. That is that'll be best. So mm. are, are you finished? Uh, now, there are also two points. Uh, so if uh, there are multiple behaviors uh, inside a, a bag, so for example, a malicious and benign, uh, it won't be properly detected. But uh, the author yeah, said, that, play, said that it was uh, pretty like, yeah. Different layers and limitations because it's giving its given how aggregation. Of course, maybe in mm. probably, maybe five years ago, such an aggregation or the hog vector like aggregation seems novel, but for us it seems uh, it seems okay. It seems okay, uh, but definitely the, these aggregations bring us less explainability for that. And for our approach, we also touch for the traffic. We also touch for the malware behaviors. And I think one of the, our approach is going is trying to. We're going to start with the imperial studies to understand what's the general behavior of the malware and the, the, the general behavior of the most well known malware. And if possible, we would like to summarize. And you know, we need to summarize on what is the common behavior and what the malware must do. You know, the, just like the phishing website, the people design malware or people deploy malware for profit, <clears throat> right? So not like 20 years ago, and the malware are proposed or written for fun. Nowadays, everything is commercialized, and people write malware have their economic rationale. If the malware is not profitable, is not profitable or not lucrative, um, it makes no sense for the hacker to do the job. Mm. So in yeah. this case, when we are collecting the empirical mm. studies, we were trying to see what is the most interested information uh, 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 malware is seeking. What is the most interesting information malware is seeking? And uh, if they would like to find the most interesting information, uh, what those malware is, what is the invariance of the malware behavior? For example, uh, if I'm the malware, would like to steal the bank account. You are the malware to steal the user and the cookie, etc. So, among those common behaviors, despite we are different malware, we must share some similar behaviors, and those similar behaviors will be considered as the invariance of the malware. As long as we can look into the the invariance of the malware behaviors, not only in the system level, system level is that how the malware access memory, how the malware create files, and also for the, the tra traffic behavior, as long as uh, the, the traffic, as long as the, the credential information has been stolen, they have to send back to the host. And when, what is the performance and uh, whether the behaviors of the malware sending the message back to the host, whether they have some commonalities. So I think our approach will like to and seek for the common common behaviors of those malwares and by maybe through the machine learning approach, maybe not. As long as we can come up with some good ideas of those commonalities, we can propose a new malware detections, not only for malware traffic detections, but also the malware behavior monitor. Right? Once we got these ones, we are able to uh, maybe uh, 
just like if we will have a fewer studies, not only we can use the behavior to classify the malware we have collected, but also we will use our technique to find the new malware in the internet. So that will be a, a very interesting point. Also, another thought is that, do you remember there is some on free version of Word or free version, the free version of the other, other licenses software? Some students or some people is not willing to pay, they would like to get a free version of those ones. So as long as we can, using our monitor, the malware monitors or the malware, either the, the malware behavior monitors or the malware traffic monitors to scan those malware and we can get a concern uh, whether some free version is, uh, uh, whether some free free download, the free made downloaded software is mm. malicious, et cetera. So we can work on these directions. Yeah, okay, mm. okay. That, that's, a, that's a great idea for uh, mm. experimental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so my, my point is that whatever technique we're using, whatever technique we are developing, we would finally to make the practical to detecting the real world malware. For this approach, I think this approach will not be, I'm okay with the, the approach design, I'm okay with the experiment design. But I think one of my concerns is that this traffic may not necessarily can be applied in the real world. The first is that HTTPS traffic is growing. So HTTP traffic mm. may not be that useful nowadays. And the second is that it, 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 it can define an unknown malware until now, right? It is just using some uh, malware, it use some malware traffic, which is not in the training set. So it will claim that I found some, some new malware. So we were going to do, we will, we will not do the same. Hopefully we can quickly develop a technique so that we can find some new malware on the internet and analyzing their behavior, that will be best. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Let's talk more okay. details okay. in our Wednesday meeting. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Nima. Mm. Uh, also, mm. uh, I I was thinking the same thing. Like, uh, mm. their all methods seems uh, very uh, simple. Not, mm. it's not very uh, sophisticated, and uh, ac actually, uh, the the part I skipped uh, I skip uh, about uh, the. Uh, the histogram uh, optimization uh, is quite uh, important in their paper. It's uh, it's about uh, two pages long, mm. uh, so it may explain uh, why they are on a top conference paper. Mm. Okay, but uh, also uh, while reading the paper, I have the I had the thought that uh, it was very. Uh, very uh it was written to be uh, very long like uh there were some repetitions and uh sometimes it was yeah, yeah. it was not very clear once we once we touch some experiment we can always make the experiment very long mm. Mm. okay thanks Nima. let's so call it a day let's call it a day okay thanks to everyone for attending our meetings uh let's meet let's meet next week okay bye Bye.